Welcome to Brainiac, the show where we grab science by the what's it and twist like billio. Inside the Brainiac test tube tonight, going out with a bag, the lazy men cook Christmas dinner. Make it. Our black box takes on a scrapyard crusher. Viewer Dan Crossley gets a surprise visit from the Brainiac babes. And when science goes bad, the bits you don't normally see. Would you stand over there, please, Mr. Pickle? Oh, Mr. Tickle. Tickle. But first, let's start by plugging in. Take one very large deserted warehouse. Introduce some low amp, nine volt electrical equipment, one brainiac, and you have yourself an experiment. The current that these electrode pads will carry produces electrical impulses that will stimulate specific muscle groups. Over this series, we've been experimenting to see if it's possible to perform various tasks whilst being electrocuted. Amongst others, we've established that you can't shave, can't dine, or drink wine. Can't paint. You can't drink beer from a plastic cup. You can't juggle raw eggs. And you certainly can't dance whilst being electrocuted. Today, we're experimenting to see if it's possible to practice Tai Chi whilst being zapped. Tai Chi is a series of gentle flowing movements designed to soothe feelings of stress. It's meditation in motion and requires deep concentration. Not easy when your body is convulsed by electricity. This traditional Eastern practice is all about keeping the body and mind in complete balance. But balance is the first thing to go when you're wired up like a light bulb. Our Brainiac should now be entering a state of complete harmony, but really, his heart doesn't seem to be in it. <laughs> tai Chi, one more thing you can't do whilst being electrocuted. Things that make you go, hmm. Here's one for you. Why doesn't superglue stick to the tube? Things that make you go, hmm. Christmas is a Brainiac's favourite time of year. Stuffing your face with rich food, drinking till you fall over and lots of lounging around. Actually, for a Brainiac, that's more or less like every day. But today, the lazy men are singing for their supper, making Christmas lunch. First, pre-dinner drinks. Beer, of course, but it has to be cold. A dunk in some liquid nitrogen, the quickest way to get that frosted flavour. At minus 196 degrees centigrade, this stuff will freeze anything it touches. Only a small splash needed to give the ale that frosty flavour we know and love. Cold and wet, Cheers. and there's more than enough to go round. Now, the turkey. A good scrubber. We don't want any germs. And how to cook it. Well, we could put it in the oven for three days at 180 degrees C. Or a stick of dynamite stuffed up the bum. Yep, much more fun. Like it. Instant roasting, Brainiac style. The bits go far and wide. It'll be cold turkey sandwiches well into the new year, if we can find the bits. Maybe not cooked all the way through, but we mustn't be fussy at this special time of year. Play press! The Lazy Man's Guide to Christmas Dinner. Fans of Brainiac will know that from time to time we like to invite D-list celebrities to come along and inhale helium-filled balloons and speak. All very simple and straightforward. Well, you'd think so, but not if your name's John Fashionu. To be honest, most celebrities we ask to do this get the general idea fairly quickly. The basic principle is, after all, pretty simple. You get handed a balloon full of helium, you suck up a lungful, and then you say the words. 
Factory Daughter, and you are watching Raymag. <laughs> All fairly straightforward, you would think. Not, it seems, for John Fashionu. Now focus. Focus. Now, I don't think he got the focus. hang of the breathing in bit. And you're watching Brainiac. I think you might need a bit more healing. Take a really big deep breath in and suck it right in. <laughs> OK, take two. You can do it, John. Focus. Now, focus. No. I'm John Fashionu, and you're watching Brainiac. Now, how do we tell him? I don't know if it's getting into your lungs. Um, so just take a deeper breath out and then let it all go in. Right, this is the one. No, 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 John. Ooh. Now, focus. 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 It suck, John, I'm not blow. Real breath out and then just let so, it all suck, suck. You could probably get the rest of that in. Just wait a moment. Don't breathe into the and balloon. Then, don't breathe into the balloon. Breathe out into the air. Oh. There's a breath yeah, out. And then take it all in, yeah? And then put this into me. Exactly, yeah. So breathe out into the air, then blow to the mouth. High on don't have to do focus. Okay. Okay? okay. So That's it. We're in business now. I'm John Fashion. Oh <laughs> 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 my boy's got okay. funny then. Yes, okay? that is the point, John. Right. Last yet. try. <sighs> oh please! No, don't blow the balloon up. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, ready? Breathe out, yeah. Okay, ready? Yeah. Focus. Now focus. I'm John Fashionu, and you're watching Brainiac. Oh, forget it. It's a momentous day down at Big Bang Farm as the girls await the arrival of a very important letter. It's arrived! Ooh. Finally, it's here. The letter from HQ with the shortlist of finalists for the Explosive of the Week competition. Madge's nimble fingers work fast to reveal the list of finalists. Many are called, but few are chosen. In fact, there can be only one winner. So which of these hardcore Big Bang fans will it be? What fairer way to decide than a one-off spin of the wheel? Twelve names in the frame, eleven will miss out on the experience of a lifetime, and one gets lucky. Right then, spin that wheel! The fickle finger of fate will decide. One good spin. The arrow whizzes past the names, round and round, till inevitably it slows to land on its final resting place. Dan Crossley it is, then. The lucky man who'll be finding these babes on his front doorstep. A nice surprise for him then. Join us later in the show to see what happens when the babes pull up outside his front door. Science, the Brainiac alternative to pork scratchings. I bet you this fiver, I can turn balloons into a kebab, a balloon kebab. Uh, no, seriously, I can. I've got some yeah, prepared. To... Yeah, I've got some prepared earlier. <sighs> Blow the balloon up, and then I'm going to stick that skewer through the balloon, and it won't burst. And it's not a trick. You just have to find the bit where it's not under tension. So start there All right. and go through here. There we go, there we go. It's through the first bit oh. and now through the other bit where it's, that's it. This is real cutting edge science. Oh, it's sh well, my... oh, come on, give us another chance. Work Just today. It's nearly working. It's gonna work, it's gonna work. Just need to be patient. Go on. <laughs> One of these brainiacs is smiling for real. The other is faking it. Do you know which is which? Well, the one on the left is the fake. The one on the right, the real. Right. Now try these. We've told half of them a joke and asked half of them to do a pretend smile. Some are real, some are putting it on. Can you spot the real from the smarmy? Most people are fairly bad at spotting fake smiles. It may be because it makes it easier for people to get along if they don't always know what others are feeling. 
The two types of smile are generated by different muscles and controlled by different parts of the brain. Fake smiles, like those favoured by air hostesses and Gabby Roslin, use the muscles that pull the corners of the mouth outwards. They're controlled by the conscious part of the brain. Real smiles, on the other hand, also raise the cheeks, making the eyes crease up and the eyebrows dip slightly. These happen as an unconscious reaction. In this experiment, you've done well if you've managed to spot over 50% of the fakes. We're now sending these brainiacs off to practice their cheesy grin. They may well need it for their next job. Do you want fries with that? Hmm. This object has been magnified 50 times. You're seeing it on a larger scale than you're used to. It's hunted by sports people the world over. What do you think it is? Find out after the break. Also to come, Dr Bunhead enjoys a healthy breakfast. While tall and small size each other up for one final duel. This is Brainiac, the show where science wears shades. Still to come, Brainiac boffin John Tickle brings the big screen to his front room. And we disrespect another microwave oven. Hmm. Earlier, we showed you this. It's an object that's been magnified 50 times. Men often lie to other men about its size, depending on where they caught it. It is fish scales. You know when you're a kid and your mum tells you to wrap up warm to stop you catching your death of cold? Well, we at Brainiac reckon that's rubbish. You don't catch cold from being cold. And we're prepared to sacrifice one of our Brainiacs to prove it. I'm cold. Neil is our most expendable Brainiac, so we volunteered him to try and get a cold. OK, get in the bath, please. Colds and the flu are more common during the winter months, but scientists are of the opinion that you can only catch a cold if you are exposed to a virus and that being cold doesn't make you more vulnerable to get them. They say that colds are more common in the cold weather because that's when the viruses tend to spread. Is that true? Well, it may involve a little pain along the way, for him, obviously, but we're determined to find out. A bag of frozen peas to keep the head cool and a nice lolly in the mouth to, well, just make him look stupid, really. OK, enough of that. Don't want to kill him. Not before the experiment's over, anyway. So to warm him up, we allow him a shower. Cold, mind you. And after that, it's a trip down to the Brainiac lab. And against his mum's best advice, he's throwing his vest away. And, yes, going out with wet hair. So what's planned at the lab? Well, standing around in drafts is also believed to be a major cause of colds and flu. So we brought out the pneumonia-inducing big fan. That ain't no way to have fun. Sun, sun, sun. An hour in the breeze to add to his misery, and two weeks later, he's still at it. Out on the streets on the coldest day of the year. And guess what? Still nothing. So it appears that going out in the cold will not give you a cold. But we're carrying on with the experiment just to make sure. We will be letting him know sometime. Run out of cereal for breakfast? Not to worry. Try this. Make your own. This stuff is environmentally friendly packaging and it's made from the finest cornstarch. Just add milk! Yummy! Just make sure you don't eat the polystyrene ones! The Appliance of Science!
Come on, son. Today, it's balance. Come on, come have a go. And it's a day out in the park for Dad and his lad. Dad knows that balance is a state of equilibrium where all forces are equal and opposite. This equilibrium is lost if the forces change. Another great lesson. So remember, kids, don't mess with balance. Dear John, my mate Spen read on the internet that you can build your own home cinema projection system for less than 50 quid, using a TV and a few other bits and pieces. Is this true, or is it just another internet scam? From Daniel in London. Well, there's only one way to find out, Daniel. A few days ago, I sent away a fiver to an internet site, and they came back with this lens and a few plans. We're going to use these to turn this 14-inch television into a large screen projector. So that was 28 and a half centimetres. That's the plan, but whether or not it's successful remains to be seen. Right, that's the side pieces done. Now I've got to create the focusing board for the focusing box. Looks like I'm going to need the skill of a surgeon for this bit. Now, making this thing isn't exactly what you'd call rocket science. It's more geometry. And there we have it. One circle later, our focusing board. And now to stick the whole thing together. Ten minutes in and the plans, so far, seem to be accurate. We could be onto a winner. The assembly's almost complete. So now all we have to do is stick this Fresnel lens onto our focusing board. Fresnel lenses were first used in the 1800s, focusing the beams of light in lighthouses. Nowadays, you can find them in traffic lights, overhead projectors and dodgy homemade cinema systems. Step 11, turn your TV upside down. Because we're using a lens, the image will be inverted, so we've got to turn the TV upside down to compensate. Luckily, I've got a nice big white wall at home to use as a screen. All we need to do now is put this massive monstrosity on something stable, so I've chosen an ironing board. I know, it might not be the best-looking system in the world, but, hey, if it works for a fiver, it's a bargain. Time for lights out. And now, the moment of truth. Well, do you want the good news or the bad news? The good news is, we can see the picture. The bad news is, it's about four times as small as when we started. Hmm. Lights, please. Thank you. Right, I think the problem is that the lens is too far away from the telly, so I'm just going to swap things around a bit. Lights, please. Hey, it's bigger. However, in this case, bigger isn't better. The picture's quite soft. A 42-inch plasma screen, it ain't. And the very observant amongst you may also notice the picture is back to front. This is the original on the left, and this is our five-quid projected version on the right. Well, I think we've proved the theory. It might not be the sharpest picture in the world, but if you don't mind a dim image that's back to front, produced by a four-foot monstrosity on an ironing board in the middle of your living room, I reckon it's a fiver well spent. <laughs> And one uses for a wee! Having fun at the seaside? Yes, swimming is such fun. But oh no, it can be a bit cold, especially in England. But wait! How about using some homegrown central heating? Have a wee! Yes, that's right. Urine is a snuggly 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's a lot warmer than the chilly old English Channel. And if that doesn't keep you warm long enough, we know a few mates who can help. <laughs> Only kidding! Keep warm at the seaside. Have a wee! You know it makes sense. Stop! Stop. The following experiment is dangerous. For your safety and the protection of those around you, do not try this at home. No, really, don't. This is a Christmas tree decoration, often referred to as a bauble. It's coated in a thin layer of aluminium foil. When the microwave is turned on, the foil vaporises due to the large amount of current. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell. The lightning-like visuals you see are electric arcs travelling through the vapour. We do these experiments so you don't have to. Do not try this at home.
day in the Brainiac Lab, our email inbox is flooded with suggestions for experiments from the great British public. The mad, the bad, and the downright stupid. Our dedicated research team go through each and every one of these suggestions and thoroughly assess them for their scientific value. Just a very few ideas actually go forward for testing. And if your idea is picked, be sure the Brainiac team will track you down. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're in London grabbing marine biologist Cy Peddleston. <laughs> if you've got an experiment you want to do, then send us an email and we'll drag you down as well. Our address is info at brainiac.co.uk. And if we do choose your experiment, this is where you'll come to get it done. Under the enthusiastic eyes of Charlotte Hudson. Today, it's Cy Peddlesden. Dear Brainiac, can people with big ears hear better? Cheers. OK, let's find out. Here we go, then. Despite myself, I'm actually vaguely interested in the answer to this one. Big ears are, of course, very funny. To everybody, that is, but the owner. But we haven't got this guy in just to laugh at him. Two guinea pigs, then, one bearing a larger set of lug holes than the other. Sai's got some numbers to read out. First, the ears get into position, facing away so they can't lip-read. We're ready. Check. OK, now it's time to test out the powers of hearing. Sai will read out a set of numbers and we'll see if big ears and little ears have heard the numbers correctly and can repeat them back. Eight, one, three, five, six, seven. So both guinea pigs have to repeat the sequence they hear. Big ears right, little ears right too. OK, let's move them further away. Gosh, science is funny. You need two good ears to tell where a sound is coming from. The slightly differing time at which they pick up the noise tells the brain where it's from. Direction, though, not an important factor in this test. They just have to tell what has been said. Both correct once again. Go on, then. Off you go. 20 metres away now. One, nine, four, three, seven, five. One, nine, four, three, seven, five. Full marks yet again. Like not to be here all day, if possible. Six, four, nine, seven, two, eight. Six, four, nine, six. Ah, five. there we go. Mr. Small Ears, not so sure this time. I am a scientist. But Mr. Big Ears has got it absolutely right. This is Cy Peddlesden. She wanted to know whether people with big ears hear better. And the answer is yes. I can do science, me. I am a scientist. There's a special day ahead for Brainiac viewer Dan Crossley. He used his red button to take part in our competition, and now the girls from Big Bang Farm are out to get him. It's Dan in. He's in his room. Well, he looks pleased to see them. Just time to grab some of Dan's precious bits and bobs. Got to have something to blow up in the final explosion. And Mum helps out with a few of his things she's been wanting to get rid of. So, off to Big Bang Farm they go. And what better way to travel? It's a chauffeur-driven limo for Explosive of the Week winner, Dan Crossley. And get this, yummy chocks hand-fed to him by the voluptuous Madge. Try boat, driver! Dan's a winner in every sense of the word. Lucky fella. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of room for Dan's special friend as well, amazingly also called Dan. He can come along for the ride, but there'll only be one finger on the trigger for the final explosion. Arriving at Big Bang Farm, full of champagne, chocolate and mounting expectation for the fun ahead, join us in part three to see what happens when Dan gets his sweaty paws on the big detonator. 
John is 7 foot 3 and little John is 3 foot 11. This is Tall v Small, where we ask the question, which is better? In today's study of physiology, we're going to see if it's better to be taller or smaller when playing a game of Twister. Right hand, green. Twister was filed for patent on the 14th of April 1966 and released the same year. Right foot, green. It's estimated that since then, well over 65 million people have played the game. Right hand blue. The rules state that whenever one player falls or lets an elbow or knee touch the mat, the other player is the winner. <laughs> Big John goes one up in the contest, and it's becoming increasingly obvious that Little John's small frame is going to be a big hindrance when pitted against the long reach of the right big fella. Hand, green. At only 3 foot 11, Little John is finding it almost impossible to stretch far enough while keeping his body above ground. Do you want a hand? <laughs> Whoa. Even with a helping hand from his opponent, it didn't take long for this experiment to return a result. Red. The towering frame of Big John giving him an overwhelming advantage. He went four games undefeated, which quite clearly means that when it comes to playing Twister, it's most definitely better to be tall. John Tickle's body can't do. Come in. Hello, Mr Tickle. Would you stand over there, please? Now, Mr Tickle, I want you to take both these pencils and close one eye. Now, I want you to hold them out and touch both ends together. You need two eyes to be able to do this, as only by them working together do you get the full picture of distance and depth. With one eye, vision is only two-dimensional. I'm sorry, nurse, I can't do that. OK, thank you, Mr Tickle. One more thing John Tickle's body can't do. <laughs> you know when you have one too many beers on a Saturday night? Well, how long does it take for you to be no longer inebriated? What time on Sunday do you go from being drunk to being sober? <laughs> Meet Neville Smith. Neville sells stationary products to people who mostly show no interest in buying them. He spends a lot of time in hotels on his way round the country. And most of that time involves long evenings sipping lonely gins in the hotel bar. We've got some bad news for Neville, though. We've been following him because we want to know how much he's drinking and, more importantly, when he's going to be sober enough to drive again. The clock ticks round past one o'clock. Sit, Dolly, I'm out of here. Time for bed, I think, Neville. Ciao. Nothing today. It's vital he gets an early start in the morning to make up lost time. He's necked eight gins, all of them doubles. That would put him about four times over the limit if he were to drive now. Fortunately, he's now in bed. But the next morning, it's ten past seven. Neville stopped boozing six hours ago. Only coffee now. He's still feeling crap. The question is, is he sober yet? Morning, Neville. Don't you look great? Can we come in? Take a deep breath and blow long and hard into there until it stops beeping. Well, he doesn't look drunk, but the machine doesn't lie. OK, that's a fail, I'm afraid, Neville. Oh, Those gins cool. might have gone into Neville in double quick time. However, they're only leaving his body at the rate of one gin an hour. You're not going anywhere yet, Mr Salesman. An hour and 20 minutes later, and Neville's enjoying a hearty breakfast. Morning, Neville. Take the breathalyzer test again, please. Long and hard breath, please. The food should have lessened his blood alcohol level, but is it enough? It's another fail, I'm afraid, Neville. No dice, Neville. You're going to have to do better than that. I just don't know what's happening. It's now 10 to 11. As soon as I can get there, I'll get to you. More hanging around, more gins evaporating from his blood, and our Neville's keen to be on the road. He should be in Kettering by three, and there's heavy traffic on the M25. Nine and a half hours since his last gin and tonic, but will he pass the test oh, this time? Oh, Neville, where do you think you're going? You're going to need another sample before I let you in there, I'm afraid. Thank you. 
Uh, no, it's a fail. Still over the 0.08 milligrams per milliliter legal limit, I'm afraid. Back in there, and let's wait a bit longer, please. Again, the big knockback. He'll never close the Kettering deal at this rate, and he's outstayed his welcome at this hotel. Only the girl at reception right, to sell to. You've done your really good line in Bulldog clips, you know? And she's sick to death of him. Ten past twelve. It's almost eleven hours since he left the bar. Right then, Neville. Have a good long blow into that, please. Thank you. Uh, OK, you are just under, so that's a pass. At last, and how happy he looks. Now Neville can get back on the road. I'm off. Deal's to be done. A relief for all concerned. Bye-bye, Neville. Back to the paper clips. Which fruit floats? Featuring Professor Myang Lee. Today, she's got a lovely pair of melons. So, what's your guess? Do they sink or do they float? We'll give you a few minutes to argue about it and give you the answer after the break. Also to come, our Explosive of the Week winner gets to blow something to bits. And where it went wrong, bits of Brainiac from the cutting room floor. This is Brainiac, the show that does for science what Anna Nicole Smith does for an old man with a weak heart. Still to come, will our black box flight recorder end up on the scrap heap? And man overboard, off his buoyancy aids reaches a gripping climax. <laughs> Before the break, Professor Myang Lee asked, do her melons sink or float? Yes, her lovely pair of melons float. Here on Brainiac, we've got our hands on something a bit special. Flown in from the USA just for us. It can withstand 20,000 feet of pressure underwater. It has an astonishing fire resistance of 1,100 degrees centigrade. It has a staggering impact tolerance of 3,400 Gs. We're not supposed to have it, but we have. It's a black box flight recorder, the strongest box ever made. And it's yellow. Today, we're down at the scrap metal yard to meet up with 10 car Tony and his son Joe. When it comes to breaking, these guys write the rule book. They don't say much, they don't need to. Round here, actions speak louder than words. And just to prove it, they give us a little demonstration. That's a Jag XJ they're ripping to pieces. In goes the claw, and out comes the engine, spat out like a lump of old gristle. They say 10-car Tony could knit a jumper with this thing, but today he's not worried about dropping a stitch. He's thinking about our box. He's planning on using one of his best toys, the 12-ton metal crusher. Why is it called a crusher? Well, remember that bit about actions speaking louder than words? Suddenly, our little yellow flight recorder doesn't look quite so tough. But hold on. This black box is no ordinary lump of metal. It has an impact tolerance of 3,400 G, and it's going in with all shields up. Seconds out, then, for the big one. The mighty claw is swung round into position. Tony's got his prey just where he wants it. And now he winds up the pressure. A hydraulic ram with over 5,000 PSI of force behind it. How long can our box hold out against the odds? Um, not long at all, really. In three metal grinding seconds, it chews it up and spits it out. He's proved his point, but he's not finished yet. 
Our box's flight recording days is surely now over, but big bully Tony goes on and on, squeezing and grinding the very life out of it. After all it's been through, is it really the end for the brave flight recorder? Just to make sure if that wasn't enough, he gets out his claw again and does a bit more damage, hammering and thuddering the life out of it till it's nothing but a lump of congealed and mangled bits. Uh, mister, can we have our box back? Yeah, thanks. It survived a full-on assault from ancient heavy artillery. It coped manfully against the thousand-degree heat of a napalm attack. It battled back against a bunch of tops and their 12-bore pop guns. When it fell off a 100-foot crane into a vat of acid, it just bounced on back. And it laughed in the face of Bigfoot and its mighty wheels. But finally, it's met its match at the hands of a car crusher mauling machine. So farewell then, Black Box. Now just fit for the scrapyard. You did us proud. In 1983, Twisted Sister sang You Can't Stop Rock and Roll. But we here at Brainiac don't believe a word of it. You can't stop rock and roll! A baseball thrown by a professional pitcher will often reach speeds around the 95 mile an hour mark. A baseball thrown by a Brainiac dressed up as a professional pitcher is a bit slower and a lot less accurate. Still, when he does manage to get it on target, it has the desired effect. Can't stop rock and roll? You can with a baseball. Over the series, this floating office has provided us with some useful information, and it's information that could one day save your life. Hello. We've looked into the future and thought about the consequences of global warming. Office workers should take special note of our exclusive Brainiac findings. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first time anywhere in the world that an experiment like this has been carried out. The question, which office products could save you from rising sea levels? First, we'll tell you the ones that won't. Absolutely and unequivocally steer clear of PC monitors. Hard drives and fax machines don't float either. Although made from wood, none of the following products will keep you afloat. Reams of paper, corner boxes, cardboard storage boxes. The aforementioned products are the ones you should avoid at all costs. If self-preservation is foremost on your mind, then take note of these office products. A waste paper basket turned upside down will support your weight, as will a cork notice board. An empty water cooler bottle and bags of polystyrene cups will also do the trick. The thing that all of these products have in common is trapped air. Even these padded envelopes lined with bubble wrap provided more than adequate flotation. You may want to remember these products. So as our series draws to a close, our Brainiac has only two choices left. There's the high water level alarm. What is he going to go for? Oh no, he's gone for the big steel cabinet. Well, thank goodness he couldn't lift that. There's no way that would float. His only option now is to go for the small drawers. So here he goes. Will he sink, or will he sink really fast? Well, our Brainiac is no fool. He's testing to see if it will float before he goes in after it. That's a clever move. And there's the answer, straight to the bottom. With no flotation devices left, our office junior will have to let fate take its course. If you don't want to find yourself in the same situation, Use the data gathered from this experiment and remember which office products are also buoyancy aids. Brainiac, saving lives through science. Explosive of the week, where every week our Brainiac babes get to blow something up. And this time, they're joined by lucky viewer Dan Crossley. He won our Explosive of the Week competition, and now he gets a chance to play with the girls. And his lucky friend Dan gets to watch. But what explosive will it be this week? After a quick consultation, it's decided they'll use all of them. And there's also going to be a very devious method to set them all off. Checkmate. Three of the girls' friends will, as ever, be judging the explosion on the quality of the flame, noise and mess it makes. 
So it's down to Bangor Field to see what Dan gets to blow up. And it's a caravan. Of course, what better object to fall victim to some of the finest explosives known to man? And the girls have loaded it up with some of Dan's favourite bits and bobs, which they grab from his house. Each possession gets its own little bomb. These ones will be set off first, before the other, bigger charges turn this caravan into an explosive ball of flame. Happy viewer Dan Crossley knows the form. He's got to lay out the detonating cable so he can get well away to a safe distance before the mobile home goes pop. And Dan meets up again with his special chum, also Dan, and sets himself to the job in hand. First to go up, all his toys, which they'll fire off with their specially rigged remote controls. Three, two, one, fire! And up they go, the little bombs making short work of Dan's worldly goods. Now it's the big one. Here we go then, for the last explosive of the week. Three, two, one! A fantastic pop! Dan seems happy, but what do the judges think? A quick consultation and they're ready to give their scores. And it's a mighty 11 out of 10 all round. Agnes, Olive and Mavis, they all loved it, and so they should. A worthy winner of Explosive of the Week. Dan Crossley gets his Big Bang Award. And off he goes to spend the rest of the day having fun with all the girls. Oh yes, and his special friend Dan gets to watch. Bye girls, bye Dans. Down at the Brainiac Lab, we've had a lot of emails from you over the course of the series. And a lot of them are from people who are saying how much they've enjoyed seeing things being blown up, shot at, burned, messed up, and chucked off high places and fast cars. All in the name of science. People also wrote to say how much they liked the more thoughtful bits. Like which household item makes the best parachute, how to make a rocket in a pub, and the best way to drive a dodger. And it appears that you were pleased we answered some of the bigger questions in life. Like, how many vacuum cleaners it takes to lift a brainiac? 25. Is silly underwear dangerous? Yes. Which goes faster, a bike or a rocket? The rocket. Or which is the hottest spicy sauce? Japanese wasabi. And one family enjoyed our cheating monkey experiment so much, they even set up a photo recreation. Thank you, the Blairs. Very good. Which one of you is supposed to be the monkey, by the way? Many people also wrote in to say how much fun it looked to be a brainiac and wondered how they could become one. Well, for all the good food, fine wine and partying that makes up the life of a brainiac, there are also plenty of downsides where life can get messy, cold, wet, smelly, irritating, rather painful. Of course, we should also mention a few letters of complaint that we received. Dr Brian Jordan of Huddersfield pointed out that we shouldn't have described a tortoise, like the one that was outraced by a snail, as a gastropod. It is, in fact, a chelonian. And army medic Eric Allen pointed out that you should only sterilise a wound with your own wing, not that of your friends. And yes, Mr Coulter, you're right. A banana, which floats, by the way, is not a fruit, but a herb. Many people also wrote in with some pretty distressing stories about being caught unawares by brown noise. That was the subsonic frequency we played which makes you involuntarily poo your pants. In particular, Joe Gurr of Rochester, who told us that it had had a very beneficial effect on an orphan kitten she'd adopted, which had been experiencing a potentially fatal bunged-up bottom problem, until our show released the floodgates and saved its little life. However, Gary Jowers wrote in from Lincolnshire to point out that if it was a vibration of the colon which caused the pooing effect, why did the Brainiacs have to put on headphones? The answer? Well, Mr Jowers, with something as potentially dangerous as brown noise, now well, would you take the risk? We are, of course, extremely grateful to the many people who pointed out other mistakes we've made. Just stand up there, please. 
What maybe you don't realise, though, is that Brainiac is a very tricky show to make. Now, Mr Pickle, would you lick your elbow, please? Now, Mr Tickle. Tickle, f*** me. Things do go wrong. I don't know why I keep the same pickle. Most of which you don't get to see. <laughs> we tend to intercept these mistakes before they get through. I do like pickle. But some inevitably slip through. And the trousers back up. We do hope, though, you enjoyed the moments that did go exactly as we planned them. 13 stereos. Eight microwaves. Nine caravans. Six cars. And one black box. You've been watching Brainiac. Science abuse. Brainiac. Mm.